Well, good morning. I'm glad that you've decided to join us this morning. Wherever you are, let it be known that our desire is to worship God and to seek Him this morning. I'm Pastor Brad Smith from Grace Community Church. I'm going to open us this morning reading from the 40th Psalm. The Word of God says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. And then the psalm ends with these verses. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are a good and gracious God, that you have delivered us from sin and death and judgment, that we can cry out to you in prayer and know that you hear us. Father, we ask that you would help us to worship you rightly this morning. May our hearts be sensitive to your Spirit's work. May our minds be attentive to your word. As we sing together, I pray that songs would be sung with sincerity and with devotion, proclaiming your goodness and your truth. Father, again, we just ask that you'd be pleased with all that takes place. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your breath. I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, a thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts. One thing I ask and I would see to see
Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. Welcome back to the Have You Heard Ranch, where the fluffy sheep sleep sweet. The sheep aren't the only ones sleeping, though. Looks like Claude and Lefty are still fast asleep, and we gotta wake them up. This is the dinner bell. It usually works, but just to make sure, when I ring it, we all need to holler, come and get it. That should wake them up. Y'all ready to help me? One, two, three. Come and get it! What? Huh? Huh? What? Oh, pickles and jelly sandwich. Claude, wake up. You're disgusting me here. What? Oh, sorry, Lefty. Annie waking us up again? Yep. Everything okay there, buddy? I reckon so. Lefty, you alright? Sure, Claude. Say, do you recall that chocolate bar I had in my pack earlier? Yeah. Do you recall me asking you to carry it in your pack and protect it so it wouldn't get squished by the extra canteens I had to carry in my pack? Yeah. Do you recall me saying that it was a very special candy bar and that I had been saving for a while and it was really important to me that I get to eat it? Yeah. Claude? Yeah? Where's my candy bar? Well, it's like this. You gave me that candy bar, and I knew just how important it was to you, so I put it in my pack. But before long, I got to worrying that it would get squished in there, and you're such a great pal, I made the sacrifice and took it out and put it somewhere safe. Claude, what do you have all over your face? My face? Chocolate? How did that get there? What is the matter with you? I was just doing it for you. You weren't doing it for me. You just wanted to eat the candy bar. You promised to keep my candy bar safe for me, and instead you ate it. Don't you know that being able to trust you to do what is right is more important to me than any protection you could offer my candy? Why didn't you just do the right thing? Lefty. What if the sheep started running around doing whatever they wanted and not following the big boss? Do you think he'd be okay with it? What if the sheep just told him they were doing him a favor and found better clover or sweeter grass for themselves and they were just going to stop following the big boss? Big boss wouldn't like that. You know, guys, the Bible talks about that. Bible talks about eating someone's chocolate bar? <laughs> no, Claude. The Bible talks about sheep following the good shepherd. John 10 says, The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Sheep obey their shepherd. And in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, we learn about a king who wasn't a good sheep. He didn't follow God, and he came up with a pretty lousy excuse. Who was that? Well, back in the time before Jesus was born, there were kings in the land of Israel. The very first king was King Saul. He started out worshiping and following God, but as time went on, he decided he didn't want to obey God anymore. He wanted to make his own decisions instead. That doesn't sound good. It wasn't. The time came when God told Saul to go to a war against the Amalekites, a nation that hated God. They were cruel and disobedient, and God had chosen to use Saul's army to wipe them out. God told Saul to kill everything and not to keep anything for himself after the battle, not even any animals. Well, Saul went to battle and he won, but instead of obeying God, he kept all the best Amalekite sheep and cattle for himself. 
God came and told the prophet Samuel what Saul had done and told Samuel to talk to Saul about it. Sounds like Saul was going to get in trouble. You're not wrong. Not only did Saul disobey God, but when Samuel came to talk to him about it, Saul lied. At first he said that he had completely obeyed God, that he hadn't kept any animals at all. So Samuel asked why he could hear the sounds of sheep and oxen. So Saul lied again and said that other people from his army had kept those sheep and oxen, but only to use them as sacrifices for God. And Samuel answered Saul and said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. In other words, God wanted Saul to obey. It didn't matter if Saul planned to do something good with all the sheep and cattle he kept, even sacrifice. Because what good was a sacrifice if it came about from Saul's disobedience? Saul didn't obey God, and he wasn't even sorry. So what happened to Saul? It was a pretty serious punishment. Samuel finished his statement to Saul by saying, Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Because Saul disobeyed God, God took away his kingdom and made somebody else king. Saul wasn't much of a sheep, was he? It certainly doesn't look like it. Sheep obey. They follow the shepherd. Saul did not obey and he didn't follow God. Well, Saul might not have been sorry for disobeying God, but I'm sorry for eating your candy bar, Lefty. I don't know what got into me. Can you ever forgive me? Eating my candy bar wasn't nearly as big of a deal as Saul disobeying God, but thank you, Claude. I forgive you. Thanks, buddy. Now, why don't you wipe that chocolate off your face and let's finish our nap before it's time for our watch. Sounds good to me. Lefty. Yeah? Got something to eat. I'm hungry. Go to sleep, Claude. Hey, guys. Again with a sleep? That's amazing. Well, since they're out again, I suppose I'll wrap this up. So far, we learned that the Bible sometimes calls God people sheep. Sheep belong to the shepherd and sheep serve. This week, we learned that sheep obey. If we belong to God, he wants us to obey him. Even if we think we have a really great idea, if it goes against what God said, we shouldn't do it. So this week, look for ways that you can glorify God by obeying him and doing what's right. I hope all of you will come back next week to visit us again at the Have You Heard Ranch. We'll try to wake up Claude and Lefty for some more stories, and for sure we'll learn more about sheep in the Bible. Y'all come back real soon. You hear? I stand amazed in the prayer. Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean For me it was in the God for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall
Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Is holy bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine! I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus. 
Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me and day by day, I know He will be new me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I. Time to get through our God questions now. If you would prepare to do this one last time, we'll see these again in a few years. Uh, but this is the last Sunday in the month of May. Uh, so this is the last time we'll see these questions. We'll get a new set of questions next week. Obviously, we're talking about in May, as you know, we've been talking about the Lord's Supper or what we call communion, which is one of two ordinances that Christ instituted in the New Testament church. The other one being baptism. But we're talking about the Lord's Supper. So the first question is the basic question. What is the Lord's Supper? And we'll say the answer together. The eating of bread and the drinking of the fruit of the vine in remembrance of the sufferings and death of Christ. Very good. Well, then we ask, what do those things represent? So the first question or the next question is, what does the bread represent? And the answer is the body of Christ broken for our sins. Well, that leads to the question about the fruit of the vine. What is the fruit of the vine or the grape juice in our, in our case? What does the fruit of the vine represent? The blood of Christ shed for our salvation. Very good. And then lastly, who should partake or who should participate in communion or the, Lord, or the Lord's Supper? And the answer is only those who repent of their sins, believe in Christ for salvation, and love their fellow man. Very good. Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Galatians chapter 4. We're continuing our study uh, through the book of Galatians. Now, last week, we talked about authentic leaders and authentic Christians. This week, we're actually going to focus in on Galatians chapter 4, verse 17, and look at counterfeit leaders and false Christians or counterfeit Christians. The Bible has a lot to say about false teachers and false leaders. There's a lot of warnings in Scripture uh, for us to make sure that we're not falling uh, pray to their lies and the deceitfulness of ultimately the devil through them. So keep your finger in Galatians chapter 4. But let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 as we begin. This is just one example in scripture of where we're given the command to make sure we're being wise in our Christian walk and being aware uh, that we do have an adversary they would love to see our testimony fail and to see us fall in the faith. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at the 7th verse. Well, beginning at the 6th verse. The Word of God says this, Humble yourselves 
under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, that God may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Here's the warning. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. So in this passage, we're given a, a glimpse of the imagery of Satan as a lion who would seek to devour and destroy us as God's people. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with the uh, 13th verse, he's talking about, it's a warning against false apostles and false teachers in this passage. And beginning at the 12th verse, uh, God using the Apostle Paul to write these words, he writes, what I do, I will continue to do, as he's writing to oppose the false teaching. What I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine, undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Paul saying, I'm going to point out that they're not like us. They're not working for the same goals and the same purpose. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Look, and this is just a couple examples in Scripture. There's many more that we could go to that point out the fact that we as believers need to understand that we're in a spiritual battle, that there is spiritual warfare occurring, especially uh, within the life of the believer, as Satan wants to see, again, our testimonies fail. Satan would seek to deceive us and have us follow that which is false, false doctrines, false teachers, false apostles. So as we come back to Galatians chapter 4, and in this passage, verses 12 through 18, Paul takes a more personal tone here, and he's, he's again still pleading with them to hold fast to the truth. I'm going to go ahead and read through uh, the whole passage again, Galatians 4, 12 through 18. But again, for our sake this morning, we're going to key in on the 17th verse. But he says this beginning in the 12th verse. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I, <clears throat> I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of the blessing you felt? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? And here's the verse that talks about the false teachers and the false uh, prophets within that church. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. So last week we went through these verses and we talked about authentic Christianity and authentic Christian leaders. Uh, this week, I want to key in on verse 17. I do think there's so many warnings in Scripture about false teachers and false prophets and Satan being the father of lies, as, as Christ uh, called him in, in the Gospels. We need to uh, take a moment, take a Sunday, and think about uh, some characteristics or some attributes of counterfeit leaders, false leaders, that would seek to infiltrate the church of the true and living God. So we'll look at specifically from this verse four points uh, that we can, uh, again, characterize false leaders by. And then uh, we'll wrap up with four general points uh, that, that characterize, uh, again, 
uh, false leaders or false prophets to help us be wise and discerning within our influences and guarding maybe those who we would uh, seek to follow or emulate in our Christian walk or in ministry. The first thing we can see here from the 17th verse is that false teachers or false leaders cater to the selfish nature of people. They're feeding the sinful nature uh, within, within us. It says in verse 17, they make much of you. So Paul is uh, contrasting his ministry of the truth that sometimes confronts a sin and confronts error with the truth of the gospel. He's contrasting that pure ministry, true ministry, with those who would just uh, like to tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. Those who are intentionally catering to the selfish, selfish nature of people. You see, these are those who would say that, that God wants to make much of you. You see, they, they twist the gospel and they twist true doctrine, which is that it's the joy of the believer's life to live for the glory of God and seek to make much of God. And in twisting that message and that doctrine to making it a, a man-centered doctrine, they would say, well, God actually wants to make much of you. And that's exactly the opposite. Our desire is to make much of God. God has saved us and redeemed us so that he would be glorified in displaying his mercy and his grace upon a people that don't deserve to be made much of. You see, sometimes this, this uh, false doctrine also is, is twisted this way. Sometimes people will say, you know, God really had to save us because we're so valuable. People are so worth it that God couldn't let, let us be judged or fall into condemnation. See, that's, that's elevating man above even the gospel and the truth of the doctrine that God has revealed. It's, it's an it's a example of false leaders really telling people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, and catering to our selfish tendencies. These are those who would say, you know, God wants to give you the desires of your heart and misapply that proverb and twist that scripture to mean something like this. God wants to give you everything your sinful heart desires. They would never say that, but that's how they apply it. God wants to give you wealth. God wants to give you affluence and influence. And God wants to give you everything that you and your fallen nature desire. It's a gospel that, again, feeds this selfish nature of people and is a false gospel. So if we want to be wise and discerning and look out for false leaders and false teachers, we need to be aware of those who are just telling people what they want to hear, that are just catering to a sinful nature within us. Sometimes we talk about the power of self-esteem. We hear that, that phrase used frequently, not only in false circles and of theology, but in a culture as well that says, you have power within you. You just need to tap into the power that is within you. And the gospel is the opposite. The gospel says that, that we are so sinful that we need another's intervention. We need the intervention of God himself, Christ dying for us on the cross so that our sin was paid for and atoned for. We need the righteousness of Christ given to us because we don't have any righteousness on our own. We need redemption. And we don't have any innate power on our own. We need to be given the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can live a life to the glory of God and defeat and to overcome sin. You see, so somebody who says you just need the power of self or to tap in the power of your self-esteem is catering to the sinful, selfish nature of people. That's a false gospel. Those are false teachers. So when Paul says here, they make much of you, that's what he's driving at. They're, they're making much of you to the neglect of making much of God himself. That's the first thing. The second thing we can see here is that they're not looking out for the good of others. See, they make much of you, verse 17 says, but for no good purpose. They're not seeking you to find your, your everything in God. They're not encouraging you to live rightly. They're not 
looking out for the good of others. It's not a self-sacrificial making much of you that they're, they're engaging in. It's a self-serving flattery that they're seeking to do. It's shameless <clears throat> flattery. It's for their own gain. See, every, every act of kindness has an angle. Every, every act of seemingly uh, something that's other-centered, they're doing not to be truly other-centered. They're, they're doing with a selfish motive. They're not looking out for the good of others as they're catering to the selfish nature of people. John MacArthur put it this way. He said, Paul is in effect saying that the Judaizers talk like they really care for you, but they're false suitors who have no genuine love for or interest in your welfare. And you can frequently identify this by people who don't love you enough to tell you things you need to hear, but will only flatter you with the things you want to hear. Because again, it's not really that they're looking out for your good. They're seeking to serve their own selves. So that's what he means when he says they make much of you, but not for a good purpose, not for anything that's edifying or sanctifying to the glory of God. They're making much of you for their own selfish ends. The third thing that we see here, it says they want to shut you out. You see, counterfeit leaders and false teachers frequently are incredibly divisive within the church. They intentionally and needlessly create division within the church. And then you know what they do. And then they go around and force people to choose sides. Douglas Moo put it this way. That, that Paul may be referring to the effect that the agitators had in, in drawing the boundaries so tightly in terms of Torah obedience. Remember the law keeping that they were demanding that they uh, had on those who, who do not measure up to this standard. It suggests, rather, that the issue is more focused on gaining disciples. They weren't seeking truth. They weren't seeking the glory of God. They were creating intentionally division within the church and then forcing people, Jew and Gentile alike, to choose sides. They were, they were making mountains out of molehills. They were creating diversion, distraction, and division needlessly within the church. And then what they do is they, they campaign quietly behind the scenes. And they call secret meetings. Or maybe they, they visit people privately in their homes and they give good gossip and they twist theology and then they demand Right? As they're flattering people, they're demanding loyalty to their side. We're not talking about essentials. That's important to remember that. And this will come up again later. But, but these are those who pick an issue that's not an essential. It can be. They pick an issue that's not an essential and twist it just to try to gain, uh, gain people to their side, gain disciples to their side. Now, in context, in terms of Galatians, they had picked an essential. They were actually distorting the true gospel. They were teaching a false gospel. They were claiming it was Christian. They were claiming it was biblical. And they were claiming that it was right. But they had so perverted truth and the gospel and were intentionally being divisive in teaching against which the, the good theology that God had built the true church upon. And that's the gospel of grace and faith alone in Christ alone for the glory of God alone. Those things we've been talking about the past months as we've been going through this book of Galatians. So he says they want to shut you out. So they're creating intentionally doors and walls and divisions within the church. And then it says that ultimately, and this is the fourth point, ultimately they're characterized by selfishness themselves. It says in the end of verse 17, the reason they do this is so that you may make much of them. So all of these things, they're flattery, they're, they're division, 
They're creating this controversy within the church. Their twisting of the gospel itself was for selfish ends and a selfish motive so that they would be popular, that they would be powerful, that they, Paul says, would be made much of. So there, th these are those, and Philip Reichen put it this way, Philip Reichen said that the, the Judaizers seem to have envied Paul's missionary success. What they really wanted was their own disciples, as false teachers always do. And I think Philip Reichen is, is, is dead on there. See, the reason they're twisting theology, the reason they're flattering people, is so that they could feed their own selfish desires and sinful nature. These are those who want to draw a crowd, not advance the kingdom. These are those who talk about how many people they've saved or how many people they've led to the Lord. Perhaps you've heard speakers at conferences or maybe even pastors in other churches talk like this and brag about this. They, they talk about how many people they've led to the Lord. And in doing that, it's trying to gather people to themselves or, or their power or maybe even you know, maybe they're trying to say how God has used them, but they're doing it in such a way that the focus is on them, not the power of God. It's not that we lead anybody to the Lord. It's that we share the gospel and God uses the foolishness of the message preached. He uses our gospel presentation. The power of the Holy Spirit uses that gospel presentation to change hearts and to change lives and to convict people and to save souls and to change eternities, to expand his kingdom. Look, and how we phrase that gives a very clear indication about whether we think it's us-centered or God-centered, whether we think the power is found within us or it's the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God himself using us and then how we do that and how we present that makes all the difference in the world because it's whether or not ultimately we're making much of self or we're making much of the God who saves and used us to accomplish some amazing things. But it's, it, it drives me crazy. And that's why I've intentionally never kept track of how many people I've baptized or, 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 or in that sense kind of been used by God to, to convict or to lead people to the Lord. Because I understand it's not me at, at all. It's God using right, my bumbling gospel presentation for his glory. But it's his power in accomplishing anything good that comes from anything good I've ever done in ministry. The only reason I've ever accomplished anything good in ministry is because God has used me and his power has done that through me. It's never been about me. So I'm always leery of people who say, I've led 4,000 people to the Lord. No, it's God who's led people to himself. You're just the means or the tool through which God's done that. And that's an amazing thing. That's not to minimize that. But we need to make sure that we're not giving the impression in any way that it's about us and not ultimately about God. One of the characteristics of false prophets and counterfeit leaders and Christians is that ultimately they make it about themselves. So we need to be careful and make sure that we're not giving that impression or falling into that kind of pride or, or arrogance. Paul here in this one verse gives us a lot to think about. The, and he gives us characteristics of these false teachers that we need to, to apply as we're evaluating ministries and pastors and leaders and teachers. And, and really, as we seek to to evaluate ministries and to um, grow in the faith under the leadership of, the, of others, because that's always good. God hasn't called us to, to start from scratch. We, we are standing on the, on the shoulders of good and faithful men and women who have come before us. But we need to also make sure that we're not following false teachers, even, even unaware. And we need to make sure that we're evaluating our motives and our lives and our ministries. And you have a ministry if you're a Christian. Even if you're not a pastor, an elder, a teacher, a small group leader, you have a ministry. 
within your family, within your circle of friends, within your, your occupation. We are called to faithfulness. Now, generally, I just want to list four points <clears throat> that usually uh, characterize uh, counterfeit leaders and false teachers as well. Just some other things to consider as we evaluate those books and authors we'll find in the Christian section of, of the bookstore. I think generally speaking, it's easy to find, and one of the things we need to be looking for are false leaders and teachers who don't point to Christ. You see, sometimes it's, it's that they teach overt heresy. Sometimes they're teaching things that are absolutely wrong, like, like in the case here in Galatians. These Judaizers were teaching a false gospel. They were teaching that you had to come under the law before you could be saved and look to, to uh, Christ in faith. That's just overt heresy. That's absolutely 100% wrong. So that's one way in which we can recognize a false teacher if they're teaching things that are untrue. Uh, sometimes it's not that obvious and that overt. Sometimes it's just that they don't point to Christ. And you can tell a lot about a ministry or a, a leader teacher. Uh, sometimes it's more about what they don't say than what they do say. Frequently, they'll just minimize the importance of doctrine. There are those who just, you know, they won't talk about sin. They won't talk about the need for repentance or from turning from sin to God through Christ. They won't talk about the exclusivity of Christ, that Christ is the only way to be saved. He's the only one who's died for us, who made an atoning sacrifice. And they just kind of minimize doctrine. It's to go along and get along and don't worry about anything else so that uh, we can just continue to move forward. And, and that is absolutely an indication of a false teacher as well, because they're not teaching the things Christ taught. You can always recognize a false teacher or a false prophet if they don't call for repentance and turning to God through Christ. If they don't make much of Christ, even if they're making much of good things, to making much of love or commitment or loyalty or graciousness or mercy, if they can be making much of, of lots of good things, but if they're minimizing doctrine and not pointing to Christ, then they need to be rejected as false teachers. That leads to the second general point here. Not only do they not point to Christ, but they frequently make essentials of non-essentials. They frequently will neglect the true essentials and want to divide and fight and argue about those things that are not essential, those, those areas in which there is some Christian liberty. They elevate those non-essentials to the position of essentials and then want to argue about those things and fight about those things and, and die on those hills while neglecting the gospel, while neglecting faith while neglecting turning to Christ alone and repentance of sin and those things that are fundamental to the gospel. Maybe they, they neglect the authority of scripture as sola scriptura, as the highest authority of, of the standard of truth in Christian life and living and how to please God. And they're looking at other things and they want to argue about other things, but they're certainly not teaching the essentials. If it's a so-called Christian ministry that neglects the gospel, neglects the authority of scripture, and neglects the things that Christ himself taught, and they want to make essentials out of those things that are not called essentials in scripture, we need to be very wary of those teachers, those people, and those ministries. Uh, the third thing, sometimes there's just people who like to argue for the sake of arguing. There are people, and I've, I've learned this very well in uh, 18 years of full-time ministry, there's some people who will argue because they love arguing. They don't care what they're arguing about. They're certainly not seeking the truth. They just love the conflict. And they, they like the confrontation. They get energized by belittling others. And, and in these types of circumstances, frequently it's just pointless to engage unless you have to kind of defend the truth and guard the, the local assembly. But there are those outside of the local church maybe that, that it's not even worth arguing because they're not seeking truth. They don't care about being logically consistent. They're frequently incredibly 
irrational because they're not actually trying to solve a problem or find the truth. Sometimes they even neglect that there is truth. If there's somebody who is rejecting the fact that there is absolute truth, then there's really no point in arguing with them at all because there's, there's no point. You're coming from such a completely different perspective. We need to get back to the foundation of truth being based upon God himself and goodness being based upon God's attributes. So there are some who like to argue for the sake of arguing. Don't follow people like that. I don't think it's healthy to be around people like that. It will lead to frustration. <laughs> it will not lead to anything that's edifying. And then lastly, frequently false teachers and false prophets generally just tell people what they want to hear and they will never tell people what they need to hear. And in doing that, they show that they don't truly love them. They don't truly care about people. They just care about themselves. It's incredibly difficult to have to tell people things that they desperately need to hear, but you know that they're not going to like. The calling for repentance and change it is difficult. The gospel at the very heart of it is a confession that we need a savior, that we are rightly judged and condemned and under the wrath of God, that we have no moral complaint if the wrath of God descends upon us and left apart from the work of God. This is exactly where we would all be. That's, that's a necessary component of our gospel presentation because we'll never understand our need for a savior if we don't understand that we are sinners to begin with. We won't understand the grace of God until we understand or at least get a glimpse of the fact that, that we are rightly under the wrath of God, deserving punishment. So we need to love people enough to tell them what they need to hear, and that includes ourselves. We should never share the gospel with anybody until we first confessed it ourselves. I'm a sinner, utterly and desperately in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Christ. But see, false leaders and false teachers don't want to have those hard conversations. They don't want to tell people what they don't want to hear. So they only tell them what they want to hear, and utterly that will lead to destruction. So people, unfortunately, I've seen this so many times, and I know, I know you have too, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. People, to their detriment, will surround themselves with leaders or listen to their favorite pastors and teachers who will never confront them in sin, who will never seek to hold anything or anybody accountable, who will never declare that there is a standard of truth and a universal command for repentance through the work of Christ. Christ had much to say about truth. Truth matters. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So if Jesus himself is the truth, we need to make sure that we don't neglect the truth. And we need to make sure that we have eyes to see and are discerning enough to recognize that which is not truth, error, that which is counterfeit. And we need to have eyes to see and to recognize those false teachers and those false prophets that are used by Satan to seek to muddy the waters and to distort the truth. And ultimately, this is the sin of Satan in the uh, Garden of Eden, the sin that he led Adam and Eve into. He told them what they wanted to hear. He told them that they would become like God. And he lied to them, pretending to be telling them the truth. Jesus is the truth. We follow Christ. We remember in John chapter 17, when Christ prayed what we call the high priestly prayer. Read through that chapter again and look for the word true or truth. Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified in truth. See, what sets us apart is commitment to, devotion to the truth. We follow Christ as the truth. And then Jesus defines truth in that prayer as the word of God. God has revealed the truth. Satan seeks to uh, muddy the waters and distort the truth and lie. And we need to make sure that we're people of the truth. So, so may we have a love for God. May we have a love for the truth. 
May we have the wisdom to spot the counterfeit. May we, may we have the wisdom to see those who would seek to lead us into error and into lies and deception. May we have the desire to spot the counterfeit so that we can respond rightly and in a God-honoring way to it, a God-exalting way to it. And when necessary, May we love God enough to be able to stand up against the lies of the devil and stand surely and firmly in the truth. I want to conclude with Ephesians chapter 6, a passage you know well, where again God is using the Apostle Paul to write this letter to the church at Ephesus. And this is the, uh, this is the passage where uh, God encourages us to put on the full armor of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. We confess as Christians that there are evil schemes of the devil that we must stand against. And I think that's why uh, sermons such as this are necessary. Maybe difficult, maybe a little awkward. Uh, clearly, I've tried to filter a lot of things and stay out of trouble uh, as, as I've been presenting this sermon this morning. But we confess that as followers of God through Christ, we believe in truth. We seek to follow the truth of God's light as revealed in his word. And that does mean standing against the schemes of the devil for the glory of God. So may we have eyes to see the authentic, the authentic love of Christ the grace of God displayed in the work of Christ. May the power of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the teaching of the Holy Spirit continue to guide us in the truth so that we may defend it and live a life for the glory of God until he comes for us. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are good and that you have revealed yourself to us. Father, we confess that we, we desire to glorify you by following you in truth. We confess that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The salvation found in no one else. May we be people who love the truth. May we, may we be wise in our opposing that which is evil. May we especially be wise in recognizing false teachers and false pastors and false prophets. May we be wise in recognizing false gospels. Father, not that we want to be contentious or confrontational, but that we want to love you in being devoted to you through the truth that you have revealed. May we be bold in that, never, never cowardly, but Father, in our, in our boldness, may we be loving and kind and gracious, uh, but never compromising uh, for your truth or for your glory. Father, we love you. We thank you for salvation in Christ. May you continue to teach us and use us for your name's sake. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all. and stain he washed it white and snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the land
leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to hear my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repay. Jesus paid it all, all to hear my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the Stain, he washed it white as snow. 